Welcome back, everybody. Uh, many of you were with us for our first hour of presentation today, which was really terrific. And now we have part two uh, of our uh, bookend presentations today, curating the cultural expression uh, exhibition at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, presented by Dr. Joanne Hippolyte. Uh, Joanne Polite is a PhD in, and she is the supervisory museum curator of the African diaspora at the National Museum of African American History and Culture with interests and expertise in African American and Afro-Caribbean material and expressive culture. She curated the Cultural Expressions inaugural exhibition and is co-curator of A Century in the Making, Building the National Museum of African-American History and Cultural in inaugural exhibition for the NMAAHC. She holds a PhD in literature from the University of Miami an MA in African-American studies from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a BA in English and Afro-American studies from the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Hippolyte. Hi, everyone. Oh, I am, am I, I am off mute, okay. And then I'm gonna share my screen. Thank you for that warm welcome. Suzanne, give me a second to load my screen. There we go. Can everybody see that? I guess I need someone. Yes, you're good. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you again. It's my pleasure to be with you here with you, the members of the University of California San Diego Retirement Association, and especially to be uh, celebrating Black History Month with you. Let me open the chat to make sure I can see that in case someone writes to me. Okay. I wanna thank um, Suzanne for that introduction. I also wanna thank the president of your association, Mae Brown, for inviting me and coordinating my participation. And also I wanna thank Suzanne for the technical logistics, managing all that. Where would we be right over this past year without our people who could help us with um, technology? Uh, as Suzanne mentioned, I'm the supervisory curator of the African diaspora. I actually joined our museum in 2014 which was two years before we opened. I am formerly the chief curator of History Miami Museum. I was their chief curator for eight, eight years. Um, before that, I was their um, curator for community research and their folk life curator as well. Um, as uh, Suzanne mentioned, my interest and expertise is in cultural expressions. That's what we call them at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, it might be referred to as folk life and folk culture in other places or traditional culture as well. And as she mentioned, I'm also a proud UC alum, having gotten my Afro-American Studies master's degree at UCLA in the 1990s. In addition to um, curating the Cultural Expressions exhibition, I also co-curated a very small exhibit located on the concourse of our museum, concourse level one, called A Century in the Making, Building the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. So I know quite a bit about the long history behind the our museum. And I welcome any questions you may have about that as well. Um, what you're seeing in front of you is a design schematic. So this is some of the behind the scenes stuff that curators encounter and work with in the process of developing a project or an exhibition. And I thought it'd be nice for you to show, show you some of the behind the scenes stuff as well. Um, so the, it, the picture, by the way, in the previous screen is me and my hard hat. Behind me is the cultural expressions cult exhibition as it's being um, sort of fabricated and installed in the museum building in the summer of 2016 before we opened. Um, we love and are proud of our hat, hard hats if we're an inaugural curator because it means we were an inaugural curator and we were there um, even before the museum opened. So this is a photo of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, I'd love for those of you who have been to our museum to chime into the chat if you've had a chance to visit and give me maybe one word, describe your visitor or what you saw there. 
um, just so to have some fun with and some engagement as part of this presentation. So I, um, this is what the museum looks like today. It's a view from Constitution Avenue. And this is what the museum might have looked like if it had been built in 1915. Um, so the history of this museum, the idea of having a, a national um, African American museum in Washington, DC, dates back as far as 1915. What you see here on the left is a coin bank. It's a, a slightly smaller than the size of the palm of my hand. It is in our collection at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It looks like a pin back button, but on the side there's a slot where you can actually put coins in. And on the, on the um, coin bank is a picture of what uh, a memorial or a museum may have looked like if it had been constructed during that period of time. On the right hand side is a parade in New York in 1912 by um, African American memories of uh, members of the Grand Army of the Republic. Now the Grand Army of the Republic was a benevolent organization um, made up of veterans of American wars. They did things like construct statues and hold meetings and commemorations. In 1915, they held an encampment in Washington DC to honor the 50th anniversary of the Civil War and African American veterans were part of that encampment. Now Washington DC, was a segregated city during that period of time. So that meant that the Negro veterans, there were places they couldn't stay. There were also places where they couldn't speak and there were activities that they couldn't participate in right here in our nation's capital. Uh, a local co colored citizens committee was charged with um, a, a finding accommodations for them and helping them with all of their stays while they were here. And it was this local colored citizens committee that decided that this was a travesty and that there really needed to be a place dedicated to and that recognizes the contributions of African Americans in all of America's war and wars. And that idea quickly by a curator of the African And that idea quickly morphed into an idea for a museum. So it became first it was a monument and then it became a museum within years, within a few short years. They designed the building, they lobbied Congress over um, over a decade. And the first legislation that actually passed was passed in 1929 to actually build this museum. Now, some of you may be familiar with what happened in 1929 and the years after, but one of the failures of Congress during that period of time with this project was that they didn't allocate any money towards the project. In fact, they expected the local Collisons Committee, which became the Negro Memorial and Museum Committee, to raise the funds to build this structure. Now, 1929 was um, the year was was around the time of the stock market trash, and it was the Great Depression happening during that time as well. So, raising money for a monument as big as what they, they needed to be representative of of um, of what the things they wanted to accomplish obviously was not entirely easy to do. So, the idea for this, um, and then on top of that, the leader of the whole project, the local colored citizens community, passed away unfortunately during that period of time. So the project was shoved into the Department of Interior where it languished for years. It was on the books, but it just languished there for years and years. No funds were ever allocated to it from Congress while other monuments and other museums were built. During di different periods of times over the next 100 years, other forms of advocacy took place to build a museum in Washington DC dedicated to African-American history and culture. A particularly active period was during the 1960s as a result of the civil rights movement and the black power movement afterwards as well. There were, there were hearings held in Congress to look at this idea and, and decide why it needed to happen. And then the latest, um, Decade of ad, two decades of advocacy happened between 1989 and 2003. Some of you may or may not know that the late Senator John Lewis introduced a bill to create an African American museum as part of the Smithsonian Institution into Congress and into every session of Congress every single year. And each year it failed until 2003. In 2003, George W. Bush signed um, legislation authorizing the African American, the National Museum of African American History and, and Culture. We became the 19th unit of the Smithsonian Institution. If you've been to Washington DC and the National Mall or you've been to New York, you may have seen all of the other units that are part of the 
um, the Smithsonian Institution. It includes a garden, it includes uh, the zoo, it includes the National Air and Space Museum. We have a museum, um, an American Indian Museum located in Washington, DC, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, New York. And of course, there are all the other museums on the mall, including the National Museum of Natural History, the Hirshhorn Museum and many, many more. We also are composed, there are also several centers that are part of the units um, of, of the Smithsonian Institution. We have an Asian Pacific um, Center. We have a Smithsonian Latino Center, for instance, and we have a Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. The founding director of the museum at the time that the museum opened, and, and now the current secretary of the Smithsonian is Lonnie Bunch. Um, of our current director as of January, literally just a month ago, he started on January 11th, is Kevin Young, who, is the, who was formerly the director of the Schoenberg Library and, uh, Library, and um, is also a noted poet. The museum opened on the National Mall in, on September 4, 24th, 2016. Prior to COVID, we had over 5 million people that had visited the museum, a fantastic number. And we were breaking all kinds of records. Um, the average visitor stay in our museum was six hours, which is not the norm um, in, in museum trends in general. And because we were doing ticketed, um, ticketed, ticketed, you had to have a ticket to enter the museum, it also made turnover really hard because people weren't leaving so that other people could get in so we could meet the building capacity. This is not a blank slide, things are coming. Um, I always like to share a few of the quotes from um, a report called The Time Has Come. That, that report was created by the committee that helped push the legislation for the museum in 2003. So they were trying to argue for the case for this museum. And there's some really poignant quotes from that. I'm gonna read them to you as they come up on screen. Until we understand the full African-American story, we cannot understand ourselves as a nation and as a people. The museum will make it possible for all people to understand the depth, complexity, and promise of the American experience. A core function of this museum is to educate as much of the American public as possible. That can only be done on the mall where visitation will be the highest. African American history is not relevant only to a particular group, but to all of America. The nation's museum system will not be complete until this museum is built because this museum will tell an important part of the American story that has not been adequately examined. A site on the mall is necessary to accomplish the goal of giving voice to the centrality of the African-American experience. Placing this museum on the National Mall squarely within the nation's front yard and alongside the other major museums of African-American history permanently and forcefully contradicts the subjugation and segregation of African, American, African Americans have fought for, for year, against for years. When we opened in 2016, there were, and there still are, 12 inaugural exhibitions spread across the five floors of the museum that the visitors can access. And these exhibitions were organized into three themes, history, community, and culture. Our history galleries are located on our concourse levels, which means they're underground. There are three levels underneath the first floor of the museum. And those galleries are our history, uh, our slavery and freedom, the era of segregation, and a changing America. Our community galleries are located on the third floor. And those exhibitions in that space are Making a Way, Power of Place, Sports, Leveling the Playing Field, and Double Victory, the Military Experience. And then the fourth floor is our culture floor. Culture floor. It's on that gal on that floor that you'll find the galleries for cultural expression, musical crossroads, taking the stage, say, and visual arts in the American experience. Is that a question for me? Point for me. Okay. So I'm sure you're curious to know how we came up with this groupings of history, community, and culture. Um, they are the result of a tremendous amount of public input that took place in 2007 and in 2008 when we did what's called our master planning for the museum. The primary stage of development of any museum involves market research. So what that means is that we talk to people in the museum field, we talk to visitors at other Smithsonian museums, we talk to visitors at Black museums around the country, 
Um, we talked to churches and church members around the country. We went to black festivals, we went to conferences, we spoke to scholars as well. So the groupings of history, community and culture came partially from that, from that research. The broad public also gave us a set of guidelines for how we should tell the, our, the story of African-American history and culture. So the questions that we asked them were, I think I forgot to mention that before, were what do you expect to see when you come into our museum? What is it that you want to see? And then how should we tell the story? So this is the sort of guiding principles for how we should tell the story that we used. They told us that the museum should celebrate and memorialize the past while empowering generations to look and plan for the future. They told us to tell the truth, be an authority on the subject of African-American history and culture and not water down the struggles or the difficult stories and emotions, the shame, the guilt, or other tough feelings that accompany the telling of this history. They said that the museum must be inclusive, engaging, and relevant. It must reflect the multifaceted diversity of African Americans, but because it is not strictly for African Americans, it must provide a way for other people to see how they connect to these topics and issues. Uh, it must do so in engaging and relevant ways. They said the museum had to tackle the difficult stuff and be responsive to issues that are discussed and debated and researched and explored on African Americans. It must be a leader and convener of public forums and able to tackle contemporary issues. And lastly, they said that the museum needs to think globally. It should reflect a global and international approach. It should acknowledge that the African-American experience influences and in turn has been influenced by others around the world. Now the cultural expressions exhibition as well as all of the inaugural exhibitions in the museum are also informed by input by a number, or area, a number of subject area specialists. And these subject special areas come in two um, camps. We had a scholarly advisory committee made up of academics of um, men from many, many different areas who helped and looked at content as the curators were developing it. And we also had the curators themselves. Curators are subject area specialists. Typically a curator has a PhD or a master's in the area in which they um, specialize their curation, curation with or, or have done or has done a significant amount of work in the museum professional field in that area. And what curators do are, is interpret content. The content that curators um, interpret are usually images and 2D and 3D objects. Uh, the products we create from that interpretation are exhibitions. We will sit on programs and talk about our subject area expertise. And we also write articles about our subject area expertise. So we also inform the shaping of what the exhibition's uh, final content would be. One of the first things we asked ourselves with cultural expressions is of course, what are cultural expressions? So there's a definition of that on the screen there that we used as a sort of as a guide when we thought about how we were gonna um, create, the con create and develop the content for the exhibition. Um, it says that cultural expressions are defined as the customs, behaviors, and practices of a people. Often rooted in historical conditions, the cultural expressions of Afro-descendants are held within and passed through families and communities and a variety of social and professional groups. Cultural expressions serve to communicate value, inform behavior, reflect beliefs, affirm identity, and sustain the spirit. In doing so, they also bind people together, they are often creative acts and they reflect continuity and change over time and across geographies. Cultural expressions are diverse and numerous and include genres such as music, art, dance, and literature. We already had music, art, and dance covered in the other galleries on the fourth floor. If you remember, I mentioned we have visual arts in the American experience, taking the stage and musical crossroads are all located on the fourth floor as well. So we wanted to differentiate between those in the cultural expressions gallery. We also wanted to use cultural expressions to introduce um, people to the broad definition of the, to culture, the, to culture, what culture is in general. We ended up landing on five cultural expressions. Food, culture, and cuisine, social dance and gesture, artistry, craftsmanship, and creativity, language, the power of the word, style, image, and identity. So these are the five thematic sections that you see in the exhibition 
um, each case is devoted, each of the wall cases is devoted to these. We also have a subsection in the in a floor cases in the ring devoted to the African diaspora. What happens in that section is we reflect on global black communities and the synergies that they have um, in, with the synergistic stories of food, social dance and gesture, artistry and language that they share in relationship to African American history and culture. Now, how we landed on these particular five um, areas, we thought about the idea of creating a sort of travel guide or a guide of sort of look into African American culture. When you travel and you go to a different place, you may notice, actually, you'll definitely notice that the food that you're eating there is different. You know, it's unique in its own ways. And we wanted to talk about what shapes black food and why it's different in certain parts of the country. You may go to a club or you may go to a carnival or a festival or see a traditional dance, a troupe, and you'll notice that the ways of dancing and the ways of um, people expressing themselves through nonverbal communication are different. You may wander into an art museum or you may go to the craft fair um, in the tourism section of a particular place and you'll notice that there are particular um, uh, ways of uh, expressing artistic creativity that are unique to a place and to a people you will definitely hear different sounds, right? Even if they are speaking English, they are probably speaking English differently than what you hear in the United, um, in certain parts of the United States. You will definitely, you might often hear other languages as well. You will definitely notice the styling choices may be different um, and the values around style and beauty may be different. Um, so we worked with this idea. So what are these, the particular black cultural expressions that show up in these particular themes? With the African diaspora, we wanted to also wanted to pay attention to the international audiences, which the Smithsonian attracts. We wanted people able to think about these themes within their own home communities uh, and, and reflect on that as well. In addition to creating thematic sections, we also have to create educational takeaways or messages when we develop exhibitions. So usually there are about three to five of these and we had three primary ones for the cultural expressions exhibition. Uh, the first one is that black people in the United States are diverse and so are their cultural expressions. Now, when we talk about diversity, we're talking about things like um, geographic diversity, cultural diversity, um, gender diversity, and there certainly diversity over time, things don't, aren't static and don't stay the same uh, during periods of time as people evolve and um, take on different preferences. One of the second takeaway, the second takeaway, takeaway is cultural expressions are influenced by contact with other groups and also influence another group. Um, we see that quite often we see uh, people taking aspects of a culture and fusing them with another aspect and creating new types of cuisine, for instance, or using hand gestures um, from different um, uh, different cultural groups in their own uh, in their own, and I think another great example of that for my own sort of folk life and folk studies is that often we could look at um, uh, folklore stories that are told, ancient myths and things, and we could find similar um, myths and stories among different groups, different groups from, from a long period of time, which suggests contact and influence, probably even earlier than we think uh, that it existed. We also wanted people to think about the fact that a number, but not all African American cultural expressions are rooted in African practices, beliefs, and traditions. So Africa itself plays a central role um, in, in black customs and practices. There are often iconic objects um, placed within a gallery space, iconic in the sense that they are large scale, they're big and they're not likely to be missed. And we wanted to reinforce, when we selected the iconic objects for cultural expressions, we wanted to reinforce the educational takeaways in them. So the first object is actually this piece, which is hard to see in this, um, let's turn off my phone, hard to see in this um, gallery space here, but it's uh, wood carving, it's very tall. It's a veranda post by, um, by an African sculptor named Olawe of Ise. And I'm gonna show another picture so you can see it a little closer up. Um, so <clears throat> Olawe of Ise is a preeminent African wood carver located in what is now known as the Nigeria region of the African continent. He sculpted things such as doors, um, games, um, bowls, all types of material. And he also trained, uh, um, he had several apprentices who he trained to do the same work. 
uh, he, he, he also created um, veranda posts for courtyards. So veranda posts hold, hold, actually hold up the courtyards and homes. Um, we chose to put this piece in the center of the gallery to talk about the fact that Africa has had, you know, this influence, this um, strong cultural influence on African-American history and culture. So it's there in the center, sort of reinforce that messaging. And then there are pieces around the gallery that also reinforce that messaging as, all, as well. We also chose it because as you can see on this particular slide, it's the design inspiration for the museum building. So the three top tier up there, um, design architect David Agai was well aware of Olawe of Issei's work and he wanted to use it as part of the, de um, the design of the museum building. Museum leadership really loved that idea as well because they wanted to um, embed ideas of hope and uplift and celebration and lifting up as part of the um, museum design. And so this image sort of reflected that. And if you look at the next page, you sort of see how they're working through these ideas, how they move off the page from this image to the um, top of the veranda post to the actual design of the museum building. So our museum also becomes this place that's inspired by African culture, um, but, uh, uh, but it's a whole different, it also becomes its own thing in the blending of all these different aspects that are part of it. It becomes uniquely African-American. There are two other objects that are iconic um, to the cultural expressions exhibition. They are the bottle tree that's at the beginning of the cultural expressions gallery when you enter it. We chose to do a bottle tree um, because um, having bottle trees, which is something you saw in the American South, particularly during the period of slavery and, um, and the reconstruction and post reconstruction, um, it, was, it was something you would see in yards um, in, of black homes. Uh, you would walk into a front yard or backyard and on tree branches, they would have empty bottles. And it comes from the belief that Africans have that empty bottles can capture bad spirits. So they would place these bottles on there. You can imagine the need to have um, a protective device and charm during that period of time when African Americans were subject to so much violence, right? We also know that um, bottle trees were a practice that white Southerners took up as well. So this, it, it, it reinforces this idea, right? That contact with other cultures influences other cultures. And we also wanted to make sure the bottle tree was there to reinforce the fact that Africans weren't a blank slate when they arrived. They came with their ideas, their practices, and their traditions. The second iconic object is the large quilt case that sits next to the um, introductory text panel for the Cultural Expressions exhibition. Um, so I'm not going to pay attention to this particular quilt yet. I'm going to talk about the quilt case itself. We wanted to use quilts because unlike the bottle tree, it's a tradition that Africans didn't practice before they became um, before they came to the United States. Africans have many textiles traditions, but um, this particular way of quilting was not one of them. It's only when African people become part of the United States that they, they learn the Euro-American tradition of quilting, and they largely learn it in the American South at the hands of Southern women, either seven women who were their slave owners or seven women that they're known. They're being taught to make these quilts for the household. And they eventually begin to take, making, take on making them for themselves. They take on making them between their communities so that you can have quilting bees. They start adding their own patterns and designs to it. And they really make the art form their own. As we know now, you can find American, um, African-American quilts in American art museums. This particular quilt, um, we rotated into this case um, the, just this past uh, year before the museum shut down for COVID. It's called the Freedom Quilt, just as it says in those letters there. It was created by Jessie B. Telfair, an African-American woman from Parrot, Georgia. She created it after she was fired from her job at the, as a school cafeteria worker for registering to vote. So it was an expression of how she felt about, um, that, um, at, about that firing. It powerfully resonates today with conversations we're having right now about institutionalized racism. I think the words freedom over and over and over again also are open to interpretation. It may, it may speak to the fact that African-Americans are still fighting for freedoms they should have had at the, you know, at the um, founding of this country today. We didn't know at the time that it was gonna resonate with the George Floyd um, 
uh, George Floyd's death and all of the um, protests taking place on Black Lives Matter right outside the gallery, right outside the museum building itself um, on Black Lives Matter Plaza. But it does, and it's a it's a it's a great opportunity for us to talk to, to bring in items that are again relevant and, and speak to discourses that are happening outside the museum. So I'll move kind of fairly quickly through the sections of the gallery and just talk about a few things in them. Uh, foodways, culture, and cuisine, as you can see here. One of the things you may notice is we have this media ring that's at the top of the gallery where we're showing images that reflect the themes um, in the wall cases themselves. Uh, we really worked hard to encapsulate the idea of geographic diversity in the food section, and we worked with the central message. Um, uh, one of the central messages of this section is African Americans, it's not just soul food, right? Because when you think about Black food, the, the one thing people think about is soul food. But we know from historically that soul food was a term, uh, is a term that reflects mainly Southern cuisine. It was invented in the 1960s by African Americans so that they could have a uh, have something to claim as their own, um, something in which they can the, to showcase that they had contributed to towards in terms of American cuisine. But we also know that geographically, African Americans have been spread all over the United States, and that you are not likely to be eating soul food if you grew up in the American North in the 1800s or in the West, if you were located there and, and you were running a chuck wagon, for instance, or in the, <clears throat> or in the Creole coast, if you, were, if you were in there, you're not likely to be having the, the things that are typically associated with African-American soul food. So we worked on the, ge the geographic diversity of black food in by telling three diverse stories about food. We told the story of red beans and rice in this case here, as a picture, it has a, uh, a bag of camellia red beans and rice. It has a recipe for Louis Armstrong's um, red beans and rice recipe from New Orleans. It has a picture of red beans and rice. We talk about the fact that the it's really uh, that Creole cuisine is really a diasporic cuisine. We know that red beans probably came um, are imported from Haiti. The white rice is definitely something that was grown in Africa and became grown in the United States as a result of skill, skilled Africans um, using their using those that practice here in the United States. And then we know that the, um, the ingredients, the spices and stuff have a lot of um, French and Spanish influence. So it really is this confluence of people and contact with each other that is formulating Creole cuisine. And in a lot of cases, it's black people who are the ones who are cooking in the homes and the plantations and the farms and, and um, that are, uh, are working to combine these cuisines and creating what we now know as Creole cuisine. We told the story of greens. We wanted to get a vegetable in, in this case here. Uh, this is a uh, pot from the Florida Avenue Grill, which is a soul food restaurant in Washington, D.C., and they have used it to cook greens for years before they gave it to us. Um, uh, we wanted to talk about greens because people sometimes often don't, don't associate African-American food with vegetables as well, but we know that you know, African-Americans were, of course, heavily engaged in farm labor and vegetables were part of their, uh, their, sta their staple and their diets for a long period of time, continue to be today. And we also wanted to talk about um, a food good that's changing because food doesn't stay the same. We don't always cook the same way that we cooked 100 years ago. This particular restaurant, um, the, um, uh, the Florida Avenue Grill, cooks, Af uh, cooks vegan greens. So they've changed the recipe from cooking it traditionally with ham hocks and is now, are now cooking it the vegan style, even while they maintain some of the traditional recipes. We also told the story of oysters. Now, why? Because that's a really unexpected story. The connection to African-Americans and oysters has really been lost. And yet, as you see here in this photograph, there are African-Americans canning oysters. In these photographs here are African-American men who own restor oyster, oyster restaurant, including Towning Dar uh, Thomas Downing, the oyster king of New York, um, a gentleman uh, who lives in Oregon, Astoria, Oregon, who owned a restaurant and, Jackson, and a, a gentleman in Jacksonville. Um, Florida as well. So African Americans were heavily involved in the oyster industry in the 18th and 19th century when there was a huge American appetite for oysters. They worked on the boats that went out and harvested oysters. They tongued them individually if they and, and took their own boats out them took their own boats out and tongued them. They sold them on the streets as peddlers. They owned restaurants that sold um, oysters and cooked oyster recipes as well. So again, this idea of diversity as part of food culture and cuisine and getting away from the idea of it's, it's not just soul food. 
One of the things I want to point out here are all the cases in cultural expressions are double sided. So here's the backside of the food waste culture and cuisine case. Language, the power of the words. A great artifact on display here is a scroll that um, spoken word artist, artist Saul Williams created and used as part of Deaf Poetry Jams. Um, it's called Coded Language. Uh, and it's just this great, he used it, he, he would read from it, he would deliver poetry from it. We also brought the idea of diversity into language, the power of the word section, because we know that African Americans don't all speak the same too. Not everyone speaks African American slang or African American vernacular English. And over different periods of time, the, the language used by African Americans would have changed as well. So the way that we brought that in was to focus on different language forms and different language groups as well. In the front side of this case, we talk about the Gullah Geechee community and how they speak a form of their language has a lot of Africanisms, more Africanisms in other parts um, of the country that, um, that, sp that speak English. We talked about Harlem slang during the 1940s, which was popularized a lot, a lot by jazz singers. They would go around the world and they would bring the slang that was so popular in Harlem during that period of time um, and use it in their work or in, um, in the press and in their songs as well. We brought up the fact that there, of course, have always been African-Americans who have spoke perfect American English, forms of American English, you know, the King's language, as they say. We talked about the great debaters in Southern schools who integrated um, debate societies and would take and would go into the South or go across the country and, and, and beat and, and, and participate in tournaments and, um, and actually change people's ideas, change people's ideas, particularly throughout the American South about the intelligence level of African-Americans as well. We talk about the form of language used by politicians like um, Barbara Jordan, um, uh, people like Malcolm X, um, the liberation theology espoused by, uh, a preacher, uh, by preachers. We also talk about the language stylings of, of black preachers. The section called, um, style, image, and identity, looks at beauty and beautification practices within African-American culture. We talk about the fact that the standards for beauty have always been different because we never met the standards for American beauty. In fact, the standards for American beauty for Black people were actually met, were often defined against them. So things like um, a straight nose, a straight hair, um, you know, a, a, a very skinny body form or, or, or what are considered beautiful and oftentimes black body types don't fit within that um, standard. And so African-Americans have had to work within their own um, value systems for beauty and struggle for recognition of that as being beautiful. So in the style, image and identity, uh, we talk about the fashion stylings of African-Americans. We also talk about skin color um, and then the role colorism plays in defining beauty and has historically played in defining beauty. And we talk about the hair, the history of hair, moving from pressed and straight hair to accepting the, um, uh, our, our natural features through the form of the Afro, Afro and styles like braids um, and the multicultural um, hair trends that are happening today. One of the things that also happens in the galleries, we, we try to use at least one art piece in each section. And this is a piece by artist Kenya Robinson. It's awesome. It has um, threads, um, banana clips, and you can, barely see them, but they're there, Afro picks and combs, right? And she's using that to talk about black hair and the history of black hair. This piece is called Commemorative Headdress of Her Journey Beyond Heaven. And we paired it with a beautiful quote from the artist that I'm gonna read right now. Um, it says, for complex reasons of race, class, gender, I will probably have a hair conversation with other black women for all of my days like some kind of not so secret handshake of experience in history. So I, I love that quote. In artistry, craftsmanship and creativity. Now I did tell you we have a visual arts gallery, but we really wanted to put into context here, not just the art, the kind of art that you would see if someone was a trained artist and had gone to art school, studied in Paris and, um, and become a fine visual artist, but also the everyday beautification practices that black people have contributed, um, have done as part of, um, as just part of their everyday lives, as part of their work potentially, um, and as part of um, just, you know, sort of a beautifying, um, everything around them. So something, something like the seamstress that people may go to to create their communion dresses, for instance, the baker someone may go to, that, that awesome baker to create a particular cake for an occasion or something. 
we have in this case we have for instance the decorative iron work of philip simmons from charleston south carolina uh he was a blacksmith he started out by you know in the early 1900s by creating things like candlesticks and wagon wheels and those eventually went away so he moved into decorative iron work and he created these amazing grates and gates and grills that you can see all over Charleston, South Carolina as part of his blacksmith work, but they're so um, amazingly beautiful. And he's responsible for over 500 pieces that you can see publicly, you know, around outside in Charleston, South Carolina. So he's beautifying the landscape as part of his work. We brought in the work of fiber artist Mary Jackson, who's from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, where they have a tradition of making um, sawgrass and seagrass baskets, which is a tradition that comes from West Africa. Uh, we brought in the work of uh, a, a blacksmith of a very different type, but um, metal sculptor and artist, mid-century modernist jeweler Art Smith, who created these large sculpt sculptural art pieces that are considered wearable art. And we paired that with visual artists like um, Kermit Oliver, who is the only American designer to have ever designed scarves for Hermes and continues to do so today, just to talk about the range and the diversity. Social dance and gesture was the funnest part of the gallery. It's hard to see this picture here. Um, so you can't see what's actually going on here, but social dance is, uh, is dance that is um, not learned in school. You're not gonna go to ballet class and learn it. This is dance you learn within the communities among your friends at school. Your parents may teach it to you if it's a particular practice within your, your region. Um, so we talked about those particular dance forms on the back of this case. And we used the video to tell that story because we wanted to see people to see the movement rather than to have to read about a particular dance. And then gesture is our forms of nonverbal communication. Things like the side eye stare, giving dap, the grip. These are um, the fist bump that you see here in this picture. And of course, gestures of protest here like hands up, um, don't shoot. We talked about these forms of nonverbal communication and what they mean and where they come from in the black community and their particular significance. And we had a lot of fun with this case because really there's not a lot of work that's been done academically in this area. There's been some work on kinesthesiology, which is the, uh, the, the study of uh, body movement, but not enough of it tracks all of these different forms that are used you know, colloquial all the time within the community in and of itself. So we got to create our own categories and put them up there. And we, were, we knew we were um, opening ourselves up to criticism or to change or to add or to move things. We wanted people to tell us uh, what they thought about these categories and what we should add or what we should change. In terms of being responsive and being about what's going on at the time, at the time that we were curating uh, all of these exhibitions, um, uh, the Trayvon Martin um, uh, death had occurred, the, um, the Michael Brown incident had happened as well, and Hands Up, um, Don't Shoot came out as a gesture during that period. So we really quickly revamped to make sure we included that in there because at the time that it was happening, we were already in design, fabrication, and installation. And we want to continue to be, remain open to new gestures as they come in and are uh, invented. And then in the cultural expression section of the, I mean, in the African diaspora section of the gallery, uh, I just want to tell one story because it's the first object that ever became part of the museum's collection. It's a boat seat. And boat seats are used in the community of Esmeraldas, um, Ecuador. It's a black community. It's a, it's a community that comes out of the transatlantic slave trade. Boat seats are used because it's a waterside community and people travel along the boats, um, travel along in canoes there. Someone had, an artisan had sketched a, a spider onto this particular boat seat. It's the, we interpret it as a storytelling object because this seat was um, used by a gentleman named Juan Garcia Salazar's um, grandmother to, um, to, to row in her canoe, but also she would bring the seat in the house and sit down and tell Juan and his um, siblings stories, uh, folk tales, folk tales that clearly um, originated from Africa, folk tales of Anansi the spider, which we also see in the Caribbean and the American South. And Juan Garcia Salazar gave us this boat seat in 2010, long before we, no, 2005, 2005. Long before we were, in, were ready to even begin to bring collections into the museum, he had heard about the museum being built. He had a connection with the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. We loved this seat and took it in, even though we weren't ready to begin collecting yet, because we think of it as the, this artifact that also talks about the shared history, history between African-Americans and other global Black communities. 
And we tell that story here. So it's across from the language case to sort of tell a story about language and storytelling. Other things that you'll notice in the African diaspora rings are stories around things like social dance in Cuba, language in Haiti, colorism in Mexico, food in Brazil and Jamaica. So it's 444, so I won't, I'll, I'll skip this slide and I'll go to this one because every time I go somewhere, I like to pull at least two pieces of content that we might have from an area that I'm speaking in. So I looked through our collection and looked what we had to represent San Diego. And some of you, of course, will recognize these items on the screen here. We have a color photograph of the San Francisco 49ers sideline during the singing of the national anthem. It's signed by Colin Kaepernick. And at the center, you can see him there taking a knee, another gesture that um, needs to be added to the gestures section. And Eric Reed is with him also out of uniform and to his right. We also have the jersey um, as well. Um, the other thing that we have is a um, 1988 Super Bowl ticket. <laughs> it's great, but was uh, played in Denver. And then I thought I pulled this one because it's you know it's the opposite of contemporary. In our collection, we have a photograph of Goodwin Goodwin's cleaners and dyers in San Fran San Diego, and it's a circa 1945 photograph. That's all that we know about it because we bought it in a grouping of photographs. Sometimes there are a lot of photographs that collectors have, and it becomes part of one. Um, but we know that there's an African American man, obviously drying this, um, driving this truck, and possibly owned the the um, dry cleaners. We have a second photograph that shows the inside of the dry cleaners itself. Fascinating look into the process during that period of time. Um, it probably was a black business. Um, as we um, use items in the collection and need to go in and, and for, for a different purpose, we try to do more research and try to figure out more than we know when the item comes into the collection itself. But we also welcome any of you, if you've heard of this dry cleaners, and if you know anything about this particular story, this, this, um, this particular practice in San Diego to send us your thoughts as well. And then the last slide is just to say the curators sure curate exhibitions, but we don't do it alone. Uh, it took a lot to build our, muse our museum and we have a very big museum family. I love this picture in particular because this is actually not the curators and the executive staff. It's all the people who helped build the museum. The people who were on the ground with fabrication, installing and construction and they wanted to take this photograph with um, director Alani Bunch, but it encapsulate how much it took and how much people it took, the idea of how much people it took and how much time it also took to build our museum. As you can see on the right here is a list of all the different people who helped um, participate in that process. And that's where I'll end the presentation today so I can take, so I have time to take some questions. I'm trying to find the chat again. There it is, somewhere down here, right? Hmm. I'll go ahead and uh, read some out to you. So um, there, let's see, is it you that posted? The display cases of boxes to me are reminiscent of Joseph Cornell and Luis Nevelson, perhaps letterpress drawers, and for the colorful ones, even Mondrian. But is, um, is there or what is the connection with African Americans or Africa? That's a, I've never heard anyone say that to me before about the, the, the squares. As you can see, we call them rectolinear, these squares and uh, rectangles here. They're modeled on the idea of an African-American quilt. You know, the, when you see the patchwork quilt with the different um, uh, patches and squares, and you can we use the colors of the different sections to reflect colors in a quilt. So one section is yellow, the other is blue, another section is um, green. Wonderful. Um, and we have someone who pointed out that the San Diego History Center may be able to help you with your Goodwin Cleaners research. Thank you. It's good to know that there is a history center in San Diego. I'm not familiar with it, but that would be an awesome resource. Uh, and I should have started before the question and answer that I'm just overwhelmed with how amazing this, uh, this place is. And I can't wait to have an opportunity to visit uh, once COVID is lifted. Um, what can you tell us about attendance uh, at the museum with respect to race? So that's interesting. We don't um, capture that kind of data when people sign up for tickets. We don't ask them what race they're from. So while we can count how many people are in the museum because there are way different strategies for that, 
we can't necessarily um, determine specifically what race or culture they are. People like to self-identify in many different ways. What I can, can tell you is anecdotal, and that is during the first two years of the museum, we had a very heavy uh, Black representation. They signed up quickly for their tickets. They came with their family reunions and their school bus and their schools and the bus groups. And that was prime predominantly what I would say just from looking around at who was coming and get and being able to get into the museum. They got ready and they they got the tickets as much as they could. And you know, it was hard to get those tickets at the beginning. But now when I look around at the attendance on an ordinary day at the museum, it's, it's much more uh, reflective of the diversity of the United States in general. I see people of all um, uh, ethnicities and colors and and it's great to see that diversity as well, which, by the way, is what we expected, because when we did the market research for the uh, museum, the market research showed us that 26% of our audience would be African American. We clearly quickly saw that that was not the case at the beginning, anecdotally again, because we don't have the data, but it now now it may be a little more even um, even handed. Mm -hmm. is, um, is it as difficult to get tickets as it was three years ago? No, we don't have ticketing any Well, Okay, let me say that again. Be, let me before COVID happened, we had stopped doing ticketing because we had gotten over 3 million, 4 million people in the building by then. And so the press, the, the need for everyone to get in at once wasn't as much as it used to be, still had a significant amount of people coming in. Um, so we had already we had begun doing what was called um, walk in, uh, walk in passes. So that morning you could um, sign up to come in that day or in some cases, some days we'd even open for people just walk in free without a ticket. Since COVID, because of the demands of the pandemic, we've gone back to ticketing. All Smithsonian museums require ticketing now because of COVID and the need to track what's going on with the pandemic. Um, but uh, we're not open right now. Like all, all the Smithsonian museums are closed. We opened for a brief period the last two months of the year, and then we closed again when the upsurges came back up. And there was a question, did the rioters damage the building or the grounds on January 6th? Thank you. No, it didn't. We have a lot of security around the building and a lot of cameras. Um, and I would also say that, though you wouldn't think about it from the Capitol, <laughs> Washington DC tends to have a lot of cameras in the historic her and a lot of people to note when something is happening. But no, they didn't touch the building. We were, were very lucky that also, we all felt lucky that we weren't working in the building that day. We were all told to stay home. Um, that week, if even if we were, most of us are working from home during the um, pandemic, but um, the few of us who were in the building were told to stay home that week with the um, inauguration happening and um, the events. I, I certainly understand and applaud um, the need for this museum to be in Washington, D.C., but I think it's fabulous that you get out and tell this story about this museum across the country to you know so the people are aware of the wealth of what's there um so that once everything does open up you know people are motivated to go so do you do that do you do regular outreach we do we do regular outreach all around the country um literally there is not enough space in our museum to do all the program we could do we have one theater that feeds 350 people um, and so one of the ways we meet the needs of being a national museum is we do program in different um, cities. We partner with other organizations to do programs at their museums. Our Center of Religion has been very active going around doing the series called God Talk, where they're looking at the state of religion right now um, among in the black community um, churches. We, we, we pair up with um, film, uh, film festivals and, and show content from our own film collection. So we are quite a bit quite around. I think the difficulty was that when you go to our events page on the website, you only see what's happening at the museum and you don't see what's happening in all the individual local communities, of course, because it makes more sense to market to those communities rather than put it on the website for everybody to see. But we're out there. Uh, I, that said, right now, almost all of our content is um, digital. So we're, we're presenting content, sometimes in partnership with other people, but it's all online. Okay, and, and is there then on the event page, we can go and see a list of all the different online programs and presentations you're yeah. offering? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. There's an upcoming, um, upcoming events on the, um, on the mock website. I'm gonna put the... Um, Wonderful. Okay, um, other questions from members? Thank you for that comment that the history floors are, are fantastic. Thank you. It's uh, I am impressed by them as well. Our designers did an incredible job there. 
one. So one of the things to think about in terms of the design of the building is it's all different, right? When you go to the, you, you feel like you're in a different museum on every floor. That's a good thing, right? You don't get tired too quickly. But the, um, if you think about the shape of the experience, if you go into the cultural expressions gallery, people can really move around these spaces. We're not controlling how they come and what section they look at first. They may come here and then they may wander into the musical crossroads gallery. Um, that free flowing experience is built into how we uh, curate the exhibitions. Uh, the history galleries covers 500 years of history. There's one exit, it's all chronological. There's one entrance and one exit. So you have to walk the ramps all the way, um, beginning with the transatlantic straight wave, all the way up to the second election of Barack Obama. So you can experience the full trajectory of those 500 years of history. So again, that's intentional in the, in the design, in the way it's built. Even if it means you have to use the bathroom at the beginning and at the end. <laughs> <laughs> In the it's history over, segment, do it's you over have a, mile, a, by the way, that walk? So from the beginning from the bottom to the top. Go ahead. In mm -hmm. the history segment, do you have a, a Ile de Gore segment talking about the slave trade? So I'm not as familiar with the other curators content. I would think we would have it, but I don't recall it myself. But that's not to say it's not there. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right. Um, there, and when when do you anticipate it to reopen? We don't know. And we haven't been given the word about that at all. Okay, okay. Well, I'll wait with bated breath. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions I, from members? I have a question. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful tour. And I'm so happy you're on the mall. Was that land originally given to you or what kind of struggles did you have to go through to get to be on the mall? Yeah, and there's a reason why I emphasize those particular quotes from the Time Has Come report because there was no guarantee that this museum would actually exist on the mall. Even at the time that Lonnie yeah. Bunch was appointed director in 2005, they were trying to decide between six different sites. One of the things people always say about the mall is there's no more space. Like, like there's just no more space <laughs> to put another museum on the mall. Right. And, um, right. And so they had ideas for putting it just off the mall in L'Enfant Plaza. They wanted to use it to revitalize a lower economic community that needed revitalization. So we're gonna put it all off the mall. These were all, all part of the six sites that were studied. Um, and so some of the language from the time has come really helped with um, the good fight to ensure that it was on the mall where it would be have equal access to everyone else that comes to the mall to see all Smithsonian museums and equal representation in the historic core of Washington, DC. John Lewis um, helped you with good trouble. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the good fight. Exactly. And so what's interesting, because I've read the reports on the fight for the space. And what ended, because there's all there's there's all these codes that um, there are these codes that tell you what you can and cannot do in the historic core of Washington, DC. So one thing, our bu entire building was built um, in the design schematic above the ground, and we had to sink it three floors because we were too high. So that's why the history galleries are underground rather than above ground. Well, that created its own problem. There was the Washington Canal underneath the ground that we hit as soon as we went underground, which caused a huge um, uptick in the cost to sort of keep the, to move that away from the building. Um, and we now have these sump pumps in the building that are pumping water away all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> so wow. but for the other um, aspects of, of the building um, uh, that are related to space was that there are these codes about where you can put things. And so when they looked at the mapping and the codes, they really it does say there's no more space on the mall. But then someone found this really old, old um, map that had buildings in the two locations where next to the Washington Monument that were part of an earlier um, design schematic for Washington, DC. And that was what ninched the deal that there had been in the early process of developing these codes, an idea that there could be things on either side of the Washington Monument. Oh, wonderful. Well, Dr. Hippolyte, everyone will join me in thanking you so much for this absolutely fabulous presentation. Uh, it was really impressive. Uh, the building is impressive, the, the exhibitions and your presentation with us today. Thank you so very much. We all very can't wait to get there. <laughs> Thank, you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much.